happens a lot of um, meetings and consultations and things like that. Um, what really excites me about this is having the people in our congregations realize their gifting for ministry and to see that get implemented. And so um, that's what excites me. That's what makes long days and long travel around the province uh, worth it. Um, when that light bulb kind of goes off and it's like, oh, this is a gift God gave me. This is a way that I can use it, you know, in, in, in worship of him in my community. That's when it's like, yeah, today was a good day. Yeah, I like that. So it says in your uh, job description, you help mobilize congregations to reach out to their congregations. So you're seeing quite a lot of diversity around that. Parish is doing different things, different ways, people excited. Yeah, I mean, uh, New Brunswick is, is a mix. Like, it's primarily rural. Um, we do have a few urban centers. Um, and so uh, uh, virtually every parish is doing different things. And that's one of the things that I keep emphasizing is every community is different and the people in those communities are different. And so we can pull ideas and, you know, see what others are doing, but I'm not actually convinced we're meant for cookie cutter ministry. Mm. Um, and I think a huge component that parishes uh, need to be involved in is regular discernment as to, you know, what's the spirit doing in our community and what are we being invited to be part of in that. And so, you know, I'm constantly saying, okay, like what's happening, what's, what's going on in the community, what's the, you know, gifting within the parish, how, you know, how can that be used? Um, because, you know, um, my parish can't be doing what Lisa's parish does. Uh, because we are totally different people, um, you know, and so I think that's a hard thing is to not do the comparison. Um, and I noticed that a lot of, oh, uh, well, if we had, you know, the people that Neil has in his parish, we could be doing this stuff too. Well, it's great that Neil has those people, but let's use our gifts, you know, that God gave us to do what he's called us to do, which is different than, you know, um, yeah, so that's, you know, there's a lot of poverty in, in New Brunswick, um, and that's, and rural poverty is very, dif is very difficult to walk with because far fewer resources. Um, and so that becomes a challenge for parishes in, in terms of reaching out and caring for those, um, you know, particularly during this pandemic. Um, we're seeing a lot of isolation, a lot of mental health issues. Um, those types of things. And so um, it's been a real gift to see a lot of parishes have that question of how do we respond during this and how do we care for the people um, in, in tangible ways. Um, yeah. And I, I too work with um, a, a good number of rural, uh, but also towns and, and suburban urban parishes. Um, and one of the things I've discovered similar to your diocese is that God has given us what, what we need to do, what we're called to do in this place. And God is a generous God and God isn't stingy. Um, God doesn't ask us to do ministry that we can't possibly do. Uh, we can't do everything, but God gives us gifts within our people and um, within you know, the, the locations, the buildings, the, you know, uh, even geographic locations sometimes give us an opportunity. So yeah, that's great. I'd like to welcome you few people. Carol is watching and Terry and Astrid Norquay says good afternoon and about nine or 10 people on. So welcome to you. And as I said, just make yourself known in the uh, comment section, say hello and join the conversation um, that we're having. Our guest is Sean Branch, who is the parish uh, by Tile Development Coordinator. So I got to go the right combination of phrases for the Diocese of Fredericton. It's Lisa, who's the Parish Vitality Coordinator. <laughs> and uh, we're here talking about Surprise the World, uh, a book by uh, Michael Frost, which is a wonderful resource. Can you tell us a bit about, just tell us a bit about Surprise the World and Michael Frost? I think I know both of you have used this resource, so both of you, uh, tell us more about it. Why Sean, you found it. <laughs> um, 
well, I don't know if I found them, found them, but um, um, yeah, so we, um, just before I started in the diocese um, at the 2007, 17, uh, Synod, um, they had decided, the planning committee had decided to do a focus on um, Surprise the World and have that as a kind of a Lenten study was the intention behind it. And so I kind of at the last minute uh, before working for the diocese was asked to come in and kind of facilitate the conversation. And they had actually found um, people who were involved in these types of ministries. And so what Frost did with Surprise the World was basically say, as Christians, we're meant to live a certain way. And um, basically, he put it in bite-sized, tangible, um, simple to understand illustrations of what it means to be a Christian and how we're meant to live with one another and, you know, in community. And so um, out of it um, comes this kind of an um, acronym for BELLS. Um, so we're called to be blessing, to be a blessing to people. Um, we're called to eat with people. Basically, we're called to share lives with one another. Um, we're called to listen to the spirit. Um, we're called to be people who are learning, uh, particularly learning Jesus, um, learning the story. And we're called to recognize that we're sent people. And um, so we had actually, the, the planning team had actually found someone within the diocese who was doing or involved in one of those things. And so I, I was asked just to interview them for a couple of minutes, hear what those things are about. Um, and then out of that came this kind of uh, mandate to parishes to say during Lent coming up, um, we want you to study the book. And that was kind of it initially. And then it was shortly after that that I joined the Synod staff. Um, and that was kind of the, when I, on my first day, I sat down with the bishop and I said, okay, so what do you want me to tackle first? And he said, well, you did the, the you know, the Bells interview, so make it happen. Um, you know, no pressure, but um, yeah, it was, it was a real great gift. I had reached out to, to Frost, um, who I met kind of in passing at a conference a few years before. Um, and I, you know, I had no delusions that he, you know, remembered me. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm also a firm believer that people are automatically going to say no if you don't ask. So um, I told him what we were doing and he was like, what can I do to help? Um, you know, just, I mean, he's very generous that way. And yeah, so we pulled together um, sermon notes, um, small group studies, um, there was even a pack for kids, um, and we just made those available and said to parishes, in whatever way is going to work best, use the resource during Lent. And we found that at least, I'm, I'm confidently comfortable saying 75% of our parishes did it at, you know, during Lent. Some did it later, um, some I don't think have done it. Um, but, um, you know, of the ones who did it, 95% said, wow, like there was a door that opened um, by doing it. And I traveled around um, afterwards, just kind of talking with parishes. And invariably at every meeting, there was a handful of people who said, I finally realized that when I do this, that's an expression of my faith. You know, like one woman came up and said, I've been going for, you know, 10 years to the school helping to make lunches. I had no idea that that was me living out my faith. And she's been raised, like she's been in the church her whole life. And so um, I've often said, you know, and I've even said this to Frost, for us, what the book did was, it was like that missing puzzle piece that brought stuff together. Um, and so it's been really good. Um, it's been a real gift to us. Just for the benefit of the people watching, and by the way, hi, Robin, nice to see you. One of our faithful viewers, can you just tell us a bit more about Michael Frost? Yeah, so... Um, I don't know who he is. Um, Frost is from Australia. 
Um, he teaches at, a, at uh, Moreland College, which is a seminary there. Um, and he is what um, we call a missiologist. So he studies culture in the church and, you know, studies ways that they're intersecting or should be intersecting. Um, written a number of books, been, you know, um, you know, he's a regular blogger. Um, some find him a little controversial because he's not afraid to shy away from, you know, the politics of the day um, and things like that. Um, of course, you know, uh, when you get to his level, um, you don't necessarily have to worry about appeasing any particular church body anymore. Um, and um, yeah, so he, he's passionate about people. He's passionate about um, people um, realizing their gifts as well um, in, in, in life and in ministry and, and living out their vocation. Um, we had him here last June as kind of a follow-up uh, to the parish's studying. And uh, it was a gift to have him and his wife here. And I get to spend a week with them, um, you know, hanging out and having... Um, you know, there's a lot, like, there's a reason eating and spending life with people is one of these habits, because there's so much you learn from, you know, just being present that um, you don't have if, you know, you're only attending meetings, or you're just handing stuff out, like, his whole thing is about we're called to live life together. I well, say so he's probably one of the top missiologists in the world, wouldn't you, Sean? I mean, he works closely with Alan Hirsch, another top yeah. missiologist. I mean, these these scholars are um, they're pretty gifted and pretty um, astute mm -hmm. in terms of their CVs. Yeah. And, and thankfully, he wouldn't say that about himself. Um, you know, which I appreciate. He's not he's not full of himself. Um, mm -hmm. And just as a side plug, if anyone's interested, um, we can post the link to uh, my chat with him from last Thursday. Yes, it was, was very good. Say, we watched that, so if you could always type that into the comment section too if you want. Um, you can get that while we're talking. I mean, I yeah. found the book what I would call deceptively simple. In other words, it's a, yeah. not a difficult book to read, but wow, the learning that goes in behind it is immense. And you can really sense that. And that's why I think it's such a powerful resource because it is very grounded, very rooted, very informed. Um, and yet it's just presented in a way that is acceptable. And, that, and that's a comment that I heard from a lot of people. Like it was, you know, as, as they said, it was written in a language that they could understand. It was like, I didn't have to guess. I didn't have to look up words. I didn't have to, you know, you know, do all this kind of wondering. It was like, oh, here it is, um, you know, and so that's what I what I've heard. Um, that's that same comment, Neil. Is people have echoed that I could I could digest it myself, and I don't need you know a PhD. Yeah, he uses the phrase "unexpected lives" a lot. Can you just what is he talking about? I Unex wish live unexpected lives. Yeah, well, I think part, uh, part of the whole uh, thing is we're meant to be living, you know, different lives. Like we're meant to be living a life that people who aren't Christians look at us and say, you know, what's up with Lisa? Like, you know, I see her doing this, that, and the other in the community. What the heck is up with her? Like, you know, and now granted, there's loads of reasons to ask that question, but um you know, I, ideally, the answer that we would hope for is that it's the Jesus factor, right? Um, and so, like, he, he would say, and, you know, and this has been our experience of, it's one thing to, to offer a meal program at your church, you know, if that's a, an important need in your community. It's another thing to sit down and eat with the people who come in and treat them as guests. It's not, you know, I'm... I'm doing this because you're needy, like you need a helping hand. It's, hey, we both need to have lunch. Like, let's sit down together, you know? And and that's one of the things, like we saw some, some of our churches that were doing meal programs kind of shift the way they did it after kind of having that revelation of, 
okay, there's more we could be doing. Like it's, and because of that, what you do is you build relationship, you build connection with people that you can start speaking into their lives. And, 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 and so that's kind of the whole premise behind all of that is, you know, we're meant to be living in such a way that at, when people look at us, it's like, I don't know what's different. I want to find out what's different. And I want that, um, you know, and uh, sadly, I think far too often as Christians, we've shied away from that. Um, you know, I think we, and it's not just true of our denomination. I think it's true of many um we've created this culture, this mindset where my faith is a private personal thing, um, you know, and I, I don't need to discuss it. I don't need, you know, it falls in the lines of politics. Um, now, personally, I wish there was more Christians who were less um, open about politics and more open about their faith. That's my own bias. Um, <laughs> a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well. But, but yeah, I mean, imagine if all of our congregations were living in such a way that, you know, the people looked at them and said, what's up with those people? Like, there's something I want. And not in the way that, oh, what's up with those people? Like, I definitely don't want whatever's going on with them. Surprise should be a good surprise. <laughs> it yeah. should be a grace-filled surprise that people are, uh, I, I, I kind of describe it as, you know, you kind of knock their socks off by, by just being thoughtful, gracious, blessing someone, eating a meal with people, being present. Um, some of those things are pretty rare these days. Uh, people are distracted and busy and um, just simple gifts that, that surprise people. His follow-up book, by the way, is um, Keep Christianity Weird, which is the follow-up to Surprise the World. <laughs> Sadly, I get no commission from book sales, but uh, right. I do highly <laughs> recommend them. Welcome, Bill Gray. Nice to see you, Bill, as always. Uh, take us through again, so the five habits, and maybe just explain them briefly for us. And again, we want to hear sort of if anything's uh, being stimulated in your thinking for your church, we want to hear from you. Or if this is part of a national conversation about this, and we just think this is a really exciting resource. And um, Michael Frost's book, Surprise the World, and he suggests five key habits for disciples. Can you just take us, maybe just unpack them a little bit for us? Both yes, I think. So the first one is bless. And so you know, what are some ways that we can be encouraging uh, and walking with people? Um, you know, at, at the Synod, I interviewed a woman who was a nurse and she was a nurse um, at a nursing home, I believe. And one of the things she noticed was there were people there who never had visitors, either because, you know, family was too far away or whatever. And, you know, regardless of situation, if you're alone, um, that has a huge impact on your quality of life. And so she really felt a, a nudge towards um, spending time with them. And so, you know, in her off hours, she would go and visit and, you know, kind of befriend and come alongside them. And um, so one of, you know, one of the challenges that Frost puts out is, you know, are there people that you that we could be blessing in the, in the week. And so he puts it out and says, um, you know, I want to challenge you to find three people to bless this week. Um, and it, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean we've all got to become hospital visitors and, you know, do that kind of thing, um, which I'm thankful for, because that is not my particular calling. Um, but it could start off as simple as, uh, and I appreciate uh, life in a pandemic, um, proposes challenge to this but buying someone a coffee like often you know we've we've seen those and heard those stories of you're in lineup at the tins drive through and you pay for the car behind you well <clears throat> who knows the impact that that has right um you know and so often we just kind of blow it off but i've heard stories of you know people who have said the fact that someone took the time to 
kind of do that, the impact that that had on them of, you know, just shifting their day, right? Um, so, you know, it could, it could be any number of things. Uh, the second is we're called to eat and we're called to share life with one another. Anglicans generally do this really well um, in terms of, you know, food and things like that. But again, um, are we living life together? And so part of it, he, he also challenges and says, you know, is there someone new that you could be going for lunch with or for supper or for a coffee and, and spending time kind of investing in them? Third is listen. Um, this, I think, is a huge area of growth for us um, as a church, is spending time listening to the Spirit, um, spending time in prayer, spending time just saying, okay, Lord, you know, what's going on? Um, you know, we're used to throwing the petitions out. God, I need, 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 and thanks, see you later. Um, but, uh, you know, do we ever take time and say, Lord, you know, okay, what are you saying to me today? Um, or what are you saying to me in this moment? Um, third is we're called to learn Christ. Um, you know, far too few of us know scripture. Far too few of us spend time in Bible study or reading. It doesn't just have to be scripture. It could be anything that helps kind of your spiritual life. And the last one is to recognize that we're all sent. It's not just professional Christians, um, but everyone who... Um, you know, professes faith in Jesus is a sent person and we're called to be out on mission, whatever that looks like. Mm. Pretty simple habits. Um, you don't have to have a degree or a lot of money to live those out um, each week. Um, yeah, um, I, I, you had talked um, earlier, Sean, about saying this is this is kind of like going to the gym in some ways in terms of doing that. Could you say more about that, kind of these exercises? Yeah, I'm always happy to talk about um, the gym and uh, workout routines. Um, by the way, I, I've got a new workout um, package that is available if anyone's uh, looking for one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, in the... Um, I think, and I'm basing this from people I know who do go to the gym, um, is, you know, things will seem foreign when you start doing it. Like, you know, of course it's going to feel weird, you know, if your church does a lunch program and uh, weird is not the right word, but um, it would feel foreign to all of a sudden after you've made sure everyone has, you know, their first meal to then go and sit if you've never done that before, if you're used to staying in the kitchen or staying behind that, of course, it's going to be like, okay, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Guess what? They're thinking the same, <laughs> you know, but to just take that first step, um, you know, is the key to it and making it, um, you know, part in the pun, but make it a habit, make it part of your rhythm of, okay, if we do a meal program, we're not just hiding in the kitchen anymore. We're going to sit with people, you know, um, we're going to get to know people like they're not, these aren't just numbers to say we've fed so many people last year. These are Bill and Jane and Paula, like who I've developed relationship with. And, you know, I know their family situation and I get to pray for them intentionally. Um, and I think that becomes the hard part is, you know, we try something once and it doesn't go the way we dreamed it. And so it's like, oh, forget it. Um, you know, um, I had a friend, you know, drag me to the gym, you know, last summer and I went once and I hurt for three days later and I said, forget that. <laughs> um, but in, in these habits, like they're like, I'm not going to get hurt. Um, my body's not likely to be in pain for days after. Um, you know, these are some tangible habits that I can pick up and say, yeah, it's not going to be a huge difficult, like even in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I've got a friend who her and her family are currently in isolation because of a possible exposure. 
you know, when I go to get groceries, one way that I can bless them is to send a text and say, hey, I'm running out to run some errands. Do you need anything? Yeah. You know, I can pick them up, drop them off in the driveway and peace out, don't come near me. Um, <laughs> but that's a way that I can bless them while they're waiting to know whether or not, you know, they're potentially sick. Um, so even in the midst of a pandemic, there's ways that, uh, you know, we can still be doing that. Um, learning, I, I think probably the two that will be the most difficult is listening to the spirit and learning mm -hmm. because they're definitely, I hate to say this, um, but they're not rhythms that we have been great at instilling in the people in our congregations. And I say that about not just lay people. Um, it is a reality of across the board, well, you know, sadly. Um, and I think that will become the most challenging to learn how to, you know, take that time to sit, to listen, to be still, to read, to listen, you know, it could be a podcast. It doesn't, you know, if reading's not your thing, find a podcast or, a, you know, a decent documentary um, or, you know, those types of things. So yeah, I think these are all easily attainable habits, um, but, you know, it, t it takes that first step. It takes saying, I'm going to do this. Today's the day. I got a great comment from Astrid. She says um, during her prep for Thursday's Bible study last week, she read that we as Christians are very good at charity, but from a place of power, we are often willing to help someone by treating the symptoms of their problems, by not helping solve the system that causes the problems. And we don't like to get our hands dirty. That's, that's true, isn't it, though? You know, as you're saying, we like to do things from a position of separateness almost. Sure, yeah. I'll, I'll serve you a meal, but I'll be in the kitchen serving it to you. Yeah. The same as me sitting down next to you. Yeah. And eating with you and getting to know you as a human being. Absolutely. And that, that changes the dynamic. I mean, and, and I think that word power is, is a crucial one. Like sitting down, it disables it, right? Like, you know, if I'm in the kitchen, chances are I'm feeding you through, you know, a cutout window. So I've got this barrier wall. I've got these, you know, hot trays in front of me. I've even got my, you know, powerful apron that's going to, you know, and gloves that are, you know, keeping me safe away from you. And, you know, and I think the real strength comes in shedding that and sitting down and sharing, you know, that meal together and sitting down and wrestling with, you know, what's the root of, of this, you know, is like, how, uh, what created the circumstances where, you know, this person might need to be coming here? Is it, they need work, you know, it could be that, you know, there, there's not enough money coming in or lack of employment or whatever. And when we build those relationships, like, you know, I've heard stories of, you know, people realizing, oh, they, you know, they were a contractor, uh, but just out of work at the time. And, oh, wait a minute, we've been trying to find someone who could fix X, Y, or Z at the church. Um, you know, and here's a way that we can start sharing stuff, right? Um, to, and I, I think those, uh, like, I think we've all heard the expression, the emperor has no clothes. Like, like we in the church need to realize, um, let go of power. Like there is no power in thinking that we have power. Mm. But we really don't. And, and picking up on your gymnasium illustration there, I mean, this is not a marathon. This is being stretched little by little. And, stretch out of our comfort zone, trying something new, um, whether that's, you know, pr the part of the, you know, the learning or the listening or the kind of the journaling and seeing ourselves as a sent person or, or blessing and or eating with someone. Um, this isn't rocket science, <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah. little steps. I, I, I love that it's little steps and it's very achievable, kind of setting the goal of three, three a week. Um, yeah, and it can't be your family because I always have to think about that. <laughs> They don't count. I mean, you should do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> or your best friend, and, you know, the same person every week. I mean, yeah, hopefully yeah. that you're you're engaging with with a variety of people and and doing life together, coming alongside. I like that. 
I, and I would add with that, it doesn't mean that even though we start doing these things that they become easy. Like, right. you know, I have always struggled with journaling, you know, and even, you know, like I, I was a spiritual director um, who I, you know, meet with and like, <laughs> he says to me all the time, Sean, even if you like draw a picture of what was going on in your head or like a word, just like, cause I said, like, I started doing, I'm like, oh, this is stupid. <laughs> and this is after, you know, years of trying to like exercise that. But, you know, when he said like, draw a picture or, you know, write a, a word, it was like, oh, cause I was comparing, you know, comparing myself to people I know who like right. love to journal and can do 10 pages a day. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like there's not, you know, 10 pages worth of stuff that go through my head in the run of a day. Well, and basically it's a reminder anyway, right? Like it's something you yeah. can review. You go back a month and say, hey, look how God has worked. Uh, even in the smallest ways as I've been open to God using me. So it's really about that kind of work, not about beautiful prose or writing a novel. <laughs> I was really intrigued by the fact though, understand. He talked a lot about journaling. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. I just thought it was very interesting. Like, you know, he, this is a, understanding yourself as a Zen person. And he talks a lot about the importance of journaling. Why is that? Uh, well, I think, it, but... uh, I think it's for the exact reason that, you know, Lisa just pointed out is you can then go back and say, you know, oh, wait a minute, I've noticed this trend. Um, so my particular formation has been in the Ignatian tradition. And that's a huge thing within Ignatian spirituality is to do that kind of review and say, okay, you know, where have God and I been over the, you know, whatever the period is. And I mean, definitely there are times when I, in the day have, you know, written a word or whatever and, and think this isn't going to mean anything. But then, I mean, even during the pandemic, like to, to when I've gone back and looked and been like, oh, okay. Yeah. I can see, you know, this particular week, you know, my head and my heart weren't in a great space. Here's what was going on. Oh, and you know, here's when things started to get better. And I, you know, my, my focus shifted. Okay. Here's a grace um, from that, that I can pull out of it. Or, you know, I've noticed, you know, these occurrences happening, you know, through my examine, um, you know, and, and so here's some ways that I, you know, I, I see God, you know, kind of waving the flag to say, hey, wake up, dummy. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that that would, that's a, a, a real um, strength in doing the journaling so that you can then go back and say, yeah, I've seen, you know, this growth or I've seen this change because, you know, I think many of us, if we look at it in the moment, in the day, it can be like, well, nothing's really been going on. Like, my life's not that exciting. And sure, that's probably true. But, <laughs> um, you know, when we look, can look back, we can start to see those kind of trends of, of where the spirit's been and where the spirit's been leading us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got a comment from Robin who says, from experience at our free community meal, I found that if you take time to sit and eat with someone, God will provide the topic if we are willing to truly listen. I love that. Oh, that's powerful, yeah. Eating together, it's interesting. I mean, especially with the five habits that he talks about, it's sort of like um, in all of this discipleship and evangelism, there is like some real sense of uh, agreement going on all around the world uh, about these things, I think. And eating together, it's been, it's been like this discovery. I mean, last week we had Leanne talking about supper club and dinner church. And, and again, the power mm -hmm. of eating together. You do an alpha or a messy church, you know, a meal together is a crucial right. piece of that. Um, sorry and very anglican yeah we, we know this this is in our dna yeah yeah i mean whether it's the eucharist or the potlucks yeah. <laughs> i've heard it said that the you know the casserole dish is our church symbol and i think yeah, yeah. in some ways you know uh, <laughs> don't you think with that uh you know that sense of we do know how to be hospitable as anglicans it is in our dna and, and maybe you know this is sort of like as we were talking about last week um it's almost just a shift we have to make to take those yeah. potlucks or to take those teas and turn them into something missional as opposed to something fundraising and i often wonder if the the leap of faith 
that some of us have to make is just to move from fundraiser or just insider group to putting on that potluck. Let's start with a potluck, you know, but think of it as something missional, invitational, mm. outreaching, eating together with the strangers. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think if we can get our heads around setting aside the fact that we need to raise X number of dollars um, and keep forcing ourselves to do, you know, these 10 different meals, uh, you know, a year to, to offset that potential deficit or this building project. And we focus on one, what's going to give us life as a parish and as members of that parish, but also how, how are we impacting the community around us? I think if we can make that shift, you know, God will sort the rest out. Um, and, and I've, I've, you know, there's a congregation here in the diocese that um, this year, when they were planning for this year's budget said, you know, we've, you know, we've done, you know, this dinner, this dinner, this dinner as fundraisers. We're all tired. We're exhausted. Nobody wants to do them anymore. No one was willing to say, why are we doing this? Except to say, well, we needed to raise an extra 10 grand, you know, and they said, we're not like someone stepped up and made the call and said, we're not doing these anymore. The money's been there because they shifted and said, how do we do stuff that's going to give us life? And that's, you know, trickled out beyond themselves into the community. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm convinced that when we stop focusing on the dollar and focus on the spirit, um, things in our congregations will be better. Wow, that is a quote. Stop focusing on the dollar, start focusing on the spirit. I want to hold on to that. Sean, I'm wondering, um, it's a great resource, and there may be folks as individuals who say, hey, I'd like to use this, but I wonder um, about leaders in congregations or in diocesan structures, how, what are some of the options for, for rolling out this uh, really neat um, um, kind of model? Yeah, so um, NavPress, which is the publisher, has put together, so there's like a children's pack, um, um, there's small group um, questions and resources for that. There's also videos where Mike does like a four or five minute, this is what this chapter is about. Um, you know, which is, which is a nice supplement to, to him. Um, there's also sermon notes. So if a parish said, we're fully embracing this, um, you know, you can, um, I know those, those of us who preach don't normally like to have, you know, someone, um, give us notes on them, but, you know, uh, do what you like with it, whether you follow it verbatim or just use it and say, okay, this is, I can, you know, take these points, but, um, yeah, I mean, we also did it as a synod staff because um, anytime, you know, we encourage parishes to do something, we try to do it ourselves. Um, and it was a real nice gift during that Lent because um, we held each other accountable. Like that's one of the things towards the back of the book. There's, you know, I mean, let's be honest. Um, the reason the gym doesn't work for me is because, you know, when my friends who love going to the gym start talking about it, I tune out. <laughs> and, you know, but I know if one of them was like, Sean, haul your ass, you know, here we're going, oh, right, I forget, we're live. Um, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's uh, accountability is a gift. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a curse, um, which also yeah. is a shift we need to make in our heads. Um, and so he really encourages, you know, have someone who you can be honest with. Um, and so we formally, informally held what as, as synod staff, each other accountable, because we'd start off our, our weekly Bible study time and say, okay, who did, you know, anyone have a story to share that of what you did this week? And, right. you know, there were times where people were honest and there was no shame in it of, you know, I didn't get to it this week or, you know, it didn't go the way I intended, but it was like, okay, um, as long as it's a, you know, an intentional in, as long as there's intentionality in it, that's good. 
Um, and so I, I think that's the other crucial point that I'd um, recommend the parishes as well. Is if you're going to do it, make sure people are willing to be accountable. Um, and uh, I mean, that's true of so much of our lives anyway. <laughs> Um, but that became a real gift for us. And, and it wasn't like, a, oh, I see you're taking so-and-so out for lunch and I'm going to raise you. I did a home cooked dinner. Um, but it was like, you know, for some, it was like, oh, I didn't even think I could have just taken so-and-so for coffee. You know, oh, thanks. I can, I can go do that today. Thanks for that, you know, suggestion. Or, you know, someone comment, you know, saying, oh, I'm reading... N.T. Wright's latest um, book on Paul, um, you know, and it's really interesting. It's challenging some of, you know, so it was like, oh yeah, I wanna, you know, take a look at that, um, you know. Um, so th those things become a real gift as well um, mm. to, to people doing this. And the sharing of those stories too is encouraging uh, because yeah. it's not only how God might work in and through me but i see how god's working in and through you and wow god's alive the spirit is alive in our church and just even these normal everyday things yeah and and uh, yeah and as you say it's not about bragging to be like well these are the ways i blessed people this week um but it was a real nice you know like someone shared something it was like oh yeah i know someone who could, you know, would benefit from that. Or, you know, I could pick up a gift card and just drop it in someone's mailbox. Oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Like, you know, just a simple, you know, of like, oh, I want to take what you did. And uh, like, I know someone who can benefit or be blessed um, yeah. by that. And so. Well, it's been just a rich conversation. I'm aware we need to start winding up. We're getting into the wind up time. Uh, if you were to summarize what you would encourage people across the diocese, across the church to do, take God on board what uh, Michael Frost is talking about and urging us towards, what would you, what would you encourage the church to think about? I think I would say that we need to wake up, um, that we need to realize um, we have a particular calling um, and that we're meant to live lives where people are looking at us saying, you know, what's up with those guys in a good way. Um, there's way too many people who look at parts of the church and say, what's up with those guys? <laughs> like, you know, I definitely don't want that. Um, I think we need to shift that and say, you know, get to a place where people are looking at us and saying, you know, there's something about them that seems right. You know, I, I want to be part of that. Um, and, and so I, yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, as we've said, it's not, it's not a program. It's not, you know, I, I'm doing this for six weeks. I'm, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's their habits. Like once we start living these out, these hopefully become part of our regular rhythm. Um, and so I, I think not only then do we start to live fuller lives as Christians, um, but I think we'll also start to see the benefits of that um, in our churches as well. I think what I like as well is that in some cases, this is maybe some new habits. In other cases, it's kind of tweaking things that we already do. Yeah. Um, you know, the learning, I love the learning piece and the listening piece too. You know, we had uh, Archbishop Martin McDonald on talking about gospel-based discipleship. So that's a great, that's one tool that yeah. you, know, you can use. As I said, we, you know, eating together is something we already do. And there may be <laughs> a shift we need to make. There are shifts we can make. That can make a big difference. And I guess the, the biggest encouragement for me reading this book and, and thinking about all this is, is really is that the resources are all there in the people that we are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you say, he's not asking for some radical, expensive, big thing. He's actually just saying in the very people that you are, 
uh, you can really speak to people about Christ. Yeah. Um, you know, just to who you are before you ever open your mouth. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's Sean was saying about it forming. We we've used this um, this book a lot in our diocese in a whole bunch of ways. People have used it as sermon series in small groups, and we've used it in some of our regional workshops, that kind of thing. Uh, one of the comments that we get frequently is that it it's not only wonderful to be helping others or or to be doing this, but it's changing. Um, their attitude and perspective in terms of how they are listening to God. And it's, it's forming. I mean, it's, it's Christian. We talk about Christian formation. I think it's, it's, and it's refreshing in some ways. I think it's a different approach than say, you know, maybe the rule of life that we've had for, for 10 years or something. It's kind of a new way to, to approach faith and kind of refreshing things for folks. And uh, we've had a number of congregations just enjoy this and it's really put energy in the congregation. Like you can tell that, that, um, that there's a, a life there that that's kind of been sparked alive again. And we've had two men run this as a small group and they've never run a small group before. <laughs> right. um, they just said, this is easy. I can, it's accessible. Um, I don't need to be a scholar. And they've run it as small groups in their uh, respective congregations. So it's not just clergy stuff either. I think, I think mm -hmm. lay people could, could use this in an ACW or a men's breakfast um, right. over several weeks or something. It's quite accessible. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a challenge. Come on to all those men's groups out there, those men's breakfasts. <laughs> for bacon and eggs maybe read surprise the world by michael frost have a conversation about that absolutely or the acw yeah absolutely i think there could be a lot of really great conversations just about wow okay how could we make some subtle shifts how could we just shift i think there's a lot of shifts we could be making that could make a huge difference I mean, it doesn't cost money does it it takes the takes us being the people of god yeah, and I, way too often we we think the only way we can do any or see any change is either infrastructure or, or finances, and this has nothing to do with that. It's it's all about lifestyle, the way yeah. we live out what we claim to believe, um, you know, and and uh, you know, um, <laughs> there's no cost to that um it, it's all in in mindset and heart um focus and so you know um the congregations that i've seen to really envelop this and adopt kind of this as as, as a value for them have, have totally shifted from we exist to maintain ourselves to we exist to care for, you know uh, we exist to care for the community we exist to care for our parish um, which, you know, far too often we view our parish as just the ones who are tithing members. And, you know, um, uh, you know, if we actually looked at it as we're called to care, you know, for that mindset of, you know, the cure of souls within our region, you know, um, and we, we adopt that as we're, we're called to care uh, for those people. And so let's discern what that looks like in this moment, um, you know, that there's nothing but good that can come from that. Yeah, I've got a couple of comments just before we close, but I think they're quite helpful. Astrid says, recognizing things as blessings, learning and listening to God. That's something we need to learn. Um, Robin says, I think so often we listen to answer instead of listening to hear or to learn, yeah. which can create a barrier in our relationship with each other and God, absolutely. But um, Astrid just wants to know, is there like um, a study guide you can use in a small group for this? So what about just as we finish, yeah, that kind of resourcing? So if Astrid's church wants to take this on. Yeah, what I will do is I will um, track down the links for that. And because we may still have them on our website. And I'll throw those in the comments um, in the next few minutes. That would be absolutely great. Ah, yeah, Astrid. There are a few questions at the end of the chapters, not a whole lot, but there's, it's a good starter anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sean. This has been Pew and Beyond episode six conversation with Sean Branch. 
the parish development coordinator for the Diocese of Fredericton. So you always check out the Diocese of Fredericton website as well. And I've been with Lisa Vaughn, the parish vitality coordinator for the Diocese of Nova Scotia PEI. And I'm Neil Mancourt, the congregational development coordinator for the Diocese of Montreal. It's been a great pleasure to uh, be in conversation with both today. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you guys. Keep the conversation going, everyone. Let's leave lots of comments in the um, in this link, and um, we'll see you at this time in this place next week. Take care. Thank you. Good. Bye. Thanks, Sean.